always read through the paper first before you start answering the first question. Here we go. In this question here, where we're looking at the comparing the size of two ions, both of them have got exactly the same electron configuration, the same number of electrons, same number of shells. However, fluorine has only got nine protons in its nucleus and sodium has got 11 protons in its nucleus. And therefore, sodium can pull its electrons in more tightly and therefore it's got a smaller radius. So the sodium ion is a smaller ion. Um, this question here, in terms of structure and bonding, why the melting point of sodium fluoride high? Remember, don't just say it's ionically bonded. Say it's the electrostatic force of attraction between the sodium ions and the fluoride ions. So lots of energy are needed to overcome these forces. I may have also put it's a giant ionic crystal. You will always, always, always get a question where it's asking you what type of bond is formed. And obviously it's going to be a dative covalent, which is the same as a coordinate bond. And in a dative covalent bond, you've got a species with lone pairs of electrons. So if you draw the full dot cross diagram of hydrogen fluoride, you'll see that fluorine's got three lone pairs of electrons, one of which it can donate to a proton. Remember, a hydrogen ion is a hydrogen atom stripped of electrons. It's a naked proton. So the fluorine completely donates a pair. There you've now got two bond pairs of electrons. And don't forget, you've also got two lone pairs of electrons still on the fluorine, which will influence its shape later on. If we now move on to the next part of the question. Uh, the question talks about two molecules and it says draw the shape and of the two include any lone pairs that influence the shape. So we're here looking at the valence shell electron pair repulsion theory, where the shape of a molecule is determined by the number of electrons around your central atom. So let's do SbF6 minus first of all. So Sb is in group five, so it's got five outer or five valence shell electrons. It's got six bonds, so we then add on six electrons for the six bonds. And it's also got an overall minus charge, which means it's gained an electron, so we add an electron for the negative charge. When we add all of the total electrons up, that's 12 electrons around the central atom. We divide that by two to get the pairs. There are six pairs of uh, electrons altogether. So that's six bonds and six pairs, so none of them are lone pairs. And when you've got six bond pairs repelling to the maximum, the shape you end up with has eight faces, which is an octahedral shape. And the bond angle there is 90 degrees. Let's now go to H2F. Again, we've already got the number of bond pairs. It's got two bond pairs and it has two lone pairs. So it's based on a tetrahedron. However, the shape is influenced by the lone pairs. So if you cover the lone pairs up, the bond angle is, we say that it's a bent or V-shaped molecule and the two lone pairs repel each by about two and a half. So instead of 109.5, we've got a 105 degree angle. In this question, it was probably better to answer A after you've drawn the structures. So let's look carefully at these structures. First of all, you need to know that ammonia has got three bonds and one lone pair. You also know the difference in electronegativity is large enough between the nitrogen and hydrogen to get these partial charges. So you've got this permanent dipole where hydrogen is attached to an extremely electron deficient atom here. Now let's bring our molecule of water. We also know water has two bond pairs and two lone pairs. Let's put in the partial charges. And the hydrogen bond is where the hydrogen the almost naked proton on one molecule embeds itself in the lone pair of a neighbouring molecule. Now it's really important here that the angle that the the angle between your covalent bond and the hydrogen bond is 180 degrees. It's 180 degrees because you're repelling the the hydrogen bond and your covalent bond to the maximum. 
And now let's look at the next bond here, which is the oxygen and the hydrogen covalent bond. That is also at 180 degrees. So when you draw hydrogen bonding, make sure you've got this line going all the way through between the hydrogen of one molecule and the hydrogen of another molecule. If we now look at this next question here, why can't phosphine, because phosphorus is also in group five, well, we know that phosphine is nonpolar and therefore the hydrogens can't hydrogen bond. So phosphine can't form hydrogen bonds with water. Why? Because it's nonpolar. The electrospray question, you can either be asked about electrospray or electron impact. So this is in the AQA booklet and it's an easy three marks. Sample is dissolved in a volatile solvent. You then inject it through a nozzle where you've got a high voltage applied and then these protons are sprayed, attach themselves to the molecules. So these ions here, when they gain a proton, will get an overall positive charge. There's the hydrogen. Remember, hydrogen is a proton that gets a positive charge. And that is the formula of the ion. Why is it the one that reaches the detector first? Well, if you look at the relative formula mass of these, this is the lightest ion. And therefore, if they've got the same kinetic energy, it's going to have the highest velocity. The next question talked about an element this time, germanium. And it's just process when germanium gets ionized. So here's your germanium in the gaseous state, losing an electron to become a GE plus iron. Let's look at this time of flight calculation in part. So first of all, um, you've been given the information at the top and the first thing you should do is underline all the data in the question for Ke equals a half mv squared. So here's the equation and we know that velocity equals distance over time. So down here, I have written the elements of the equation, kinetic energy, mass, distance, time. You then go back to the question, put in the values and don't forget your units. Remember, M in the equation is the mass of one single iron and its units are kilograms. The distance is always in metres and here they tried to trip you up because they gave it to you in centimetres can you convert centimetres to metres? That's the distance. The time has been given to you in seconds and notice times are always really, really tiny. They fly so quickly. So that's going to be in the magnitude of 10 to the minus 6. Right, can you now realise that you're, you're needing to find the mass of an iron? So you now need to be able to rearrange this equation for a mark to get mass on its own. And the mass of a single iron is going to come out in kilograms. You now pop your values in. Put this into your calculators. And the mass of one single iron comes out to be 1.146. Don't round up at this point. Times 10 to the minus 25. That makes sense. It's so, the magnitude is really small. Now, it asks you for the mass of one mole of germanium ions. So what you now need to do is times that by the Avogadro constant because that's one single iron, so you need to times it by a big number. And that gives you the answer in kilograms. Can you convert that back to grams? You need to times it by one, two, three, six, nine. You could have checked this on your periodic table. 
Now, the mass number of an ion is not the same as the relative atomic mass. This takes into account the isotopes. The mass number of one ion tells you the number of protons and neutrons. So this can only be a whole number, an integer, because the mass number, remember, is the mass of uh, one mole of the same isotope. So it has to be a whole number because you can only have a whole number of protons and neutrons. This next question here asks you about the full electron configuration of a chromium ion. And remember, chromium is the odd one out. So in your 3D, you're filling up the 4S subshell first and then the 3D. But remember with chromium that once we put the electrons in boxes, if you are tempted to put the 4s2 and then fill the 3d in remember that all of these electrons are all of equal energy so this electron here migrates into the 3d so chromium is the odd one out 3d5 4s1 not 3d4 4s2 as you probably some of you will have said in this next question here um where you're given the 52 chromium atom, you need to go to your periodic table to work out, find out what is proton number. So chromium has the atomic number 24, and this particular isotope has got a mass number of 52. So if you take 24 from 52, that tells you the number of neutrons. This new atom has got three more neutrons, that's 28 plus 3, which is 31 neutrons. It's got two more protons, so it's got 24. 24 plus 2 is 26. If you add these two together, that, that now gives the new mass number of your isotope. And this is the proton number of your isotope. It can only be, and the only ele element it can be, is iron. So it's 2657 iron. If we now go to the next question. This time it's on calculating... Uh, you can see you've got mass numbers in the abundance, so immediately you put in this equation here for a mark. And this equation here tells you that the relative atomic mass is the sum of the mass numbers time, times the abundance divided by the total abundance. Now we needed to find the abundance of this unknown isotope. We're trying to find this fourth isotope. We don't know what its mass is. But we know when we add all the abundances together, because it's a percentage... It must all add up to 100. So 82 plus 10.9 plus 2.7 plus this last one must all add up to 100. And therefore, the percentage abundance of the unknown comes out at 3.6. Now, we simply substitute the values for this equation in. We've been told that the relative atomic mass is 52.09, which goes into here. And then... The first mass is 52 times by its abundance, 52 times 82.8. We then add that to the next isotope, which is 53 times its abundance, which is 10.9. Add it to the mass of the next isotope, which is 54 times by its abundance, which is 27. Add it to the mass of the next isotope, which we don't know, times its abundance, which is 3.6. Divide all that by 100. Multiply out your brackets. And it simplifies to 179.9 equals 3.6 times the mass of your unknown iron, 
Divide that by 36, the mass of your unknown line is 50, so you've proven that the mass number of the isotope is 50. This question was answered badly because a lot of students didn't know what the formula of hydrogen peroxide was and then just left it. But even if you'd put the wrong MR, the answers are carried forward. So the eighth hydrogen peroxide, hydrogen oxide water is H2O. Peroxide means it's got another oxygen, H2O2, which has an MR of 34. You've been given a mass, which here is 60 grams. So as soon as you see a mass, you know that if you divide mass by MR, you're going to get the moles. So the moles of the hydrogen peroxide in one decimeter cubed is 1.76, or 1.76 moles in one decimeter cubed. There's the concentration. So in hair bleach, thank goodness it's not that concentration, otherwise it would take your scalp off. In hair bleach, it's 0.05 moles per dm cubed. So in your commercial hair bleach, it's 0.05. The concentrated stuff that we get supplied with is 1.07. How do you work out the dilution factor? It's simply a ratio. How do you get a whole number ratio? You divide both through by the smallest. So the commercial with a 1 divided by the smallest to 35.5. You need to dilute it 35.3. So 35.3 times. Kick yourselves because that was so easy. As soon as students tend to see a lot of lines like this, they freak out because, oh no, it's a six marker. Remember at Salford in the at Christmas where Kirsty said, where Christy said, don't just write lots of words, use a diagram. We've all looked at this graph so many times. What happens to the first ionization energy as you cross a period? Well, you know that as you cross a period, ionisation energy increases. Why? Because as we go across a period, the proton number increases. So if you drew the diagram, it's a lot easier to explain the graph than to wander off not knowing where you're going. And it's a lot easier for the person who's marking it. So you've got a mark for saying why the first ionisation energy increases as you go across a period. Why? Because proton number increases and the attraction of the outer electron increases, so more energy is needed to remove it. Nice, easy three marks. Now, we also know that as you cross the period, that's the general trend, but there are two deviations always as you cross period two and period three. And the first deviation is with boron. Write out the electron configuration of boron. Why is it lower than expected? because there is shielding of the 2p electron and also the p electron is of higher energy. The second deviation or oxygen, again write out the electron configuration of oxygen, is lower than anticipated. Why is it lower than anticipated? Because if you put the electrons in boxes, you've got the electrostatic repulsion between the paired 2p electrons. This question was marked on level of response. You do not have to write in continuous prose. You can use bullet points.
Let's read this question carefully. So you've got this pure sample of magnesium nitrate decomposed and you've got an equation with some lovely ratios where two moles of this break down to form two moles of that, four moles of that and one mole of that. So altogether we've got five moles of gases. So we need to look at the ratio. When you see the equation, always break down the ratio first of all. So two moles give five moles of gas. So one mole of magnesium nitrate will give five over two moles of gas. So keep looking at your ratios. This is GCSE stuff. All right, the next thing to notice in the question, we've got a mass. So immediately we know we can do a number of moles. And also, if we look at the go through it, because it's a gas, you've got a temperature, you have a pressure, and you have a gas constant. Immediately, like we did with the K equals a half mv squared, write down the elements of the equation that you're going to use, PV equals nRT, because you've been given the gas constant, you know you're going to use PV equals nRT. You write down the elements of the equation with the correct units, then you can fill in the information from the question. You're always going to be using information from the question. You can see immediately that we're trying to find the volume, total volume, so put a question mark by the total volume, and our answer is going to come out in meters cubed. I've left a blank there for moles because we've been given a mass. So the first thing we can do is work out the number of moles of the magnesium nitrate. So if you've got mass, you first of all need to work out the MR of magnesium nitrate, and that comes to 184.3. So to get the number of moles or amount of magnesium nitrate, you simply divide the mass, which is in grams, by its MR. So the number of moles of magnesium nitrate comes to 2.522 times 10 to the minus 4. Do not round this up at this point. Now we need to times this by 2.5 because the ratio is 1 mole of magnesium nitrate you get five over two or two and a half moles of gas. And this is what a lot of, where a lot of students, their answer was out by two and a half times. So you need to times the number of moles by 2.5. So N is the number of moles of magnesium nitrate times 2.5 times by R. Now the temperature, have you converted your temperature into Kelvin? Divided by the total pressure so the total pressure was given to you in kilopascals. Don't forget to times that by 10 to the 3 to convert it to pascals. So the total, when you put all of that into your calculator, you get 1.745 times 10 to minus 5 meters cubed. To get it into centimeters cubed, remember you need to times that answer by 10 to the power 6 to get it back into centimetres cubed. So the answer was 17.5 <coughs> centimetres cubed. This question here is, have you done experiments where you've heated substances, which you have? Um, on the mark scheme, it said that when you're heating it, because the magnesium oxide, you're getting lots of gas coming off, some of the magnesium oxide could be lost with the gas, or uh, it may, the student may, may not have uh, decomposed it. I can't have that answer because if we read the question carefully, it said it was completely decomposed. So that proves to the examiner I hadn't read the question. And that's why you're not allowed that answer. So the only other answer is some of the magnesium oxide was blown away with the gas. On this next question, again, uh, if we go through it, let's see how, using storyboarding, this easy this question was. 
So first of all, you may not have heard the word diprotic, but you know that hydrogen is a proton. So it's got two protons. That's why it's called a diprotic acid. So they've given you the stoichiometry. So for every mole of acid, you need two moles of sodium hydroxide. We go through it here and it says 250 centimetres cubed solution are using 1,000. Why are they doing this? Can you convert your milligrams to grams? So immediately we go, let's just get rid of the milligrams. And let's say that is 1.300 grams. The next question here says, we're now going to take 25 cm cubed of sodium hydroxide and that's going into a conical flask. So here at the side, please do it. The examiners will love if you storyboard. So here's the 250 centimetres cubed in your volumetric flask. You've got your 1,500 milligrams of your uh, H2A, uh, which equals 1.300. That should actually say H2, H2A, not H2O. So there's your acid solid acid being dissolved into your flask. We then pour that into a burette. So there's your acid in the burette and your alkali this time is in the flask. So let's draw up a table. They like to see tables because it shows organization of your thoughts. There's a stoichiometric ratio. There's your acid, there's your alkali. Concentration, well, we know that the concentration of the sodium hydroxide was 0 0.0, 0 0.112 moles per dm cubed. Put the units in, it's really important. We know that the volume of the sodium hydroxide we used here in the flask was 25. And there, to work out the amount or the number of moles, it's concentration times volume divided by 1,000. Now, moles travel across, and the ratio is 2 to 1, and therefore... If we know the amount of sodium hydroxide, we need to divide that by two or times by half to get the moles of acid. We've got the volume of acid and we know the moles of acid. But we didn't have 20, the original acid which is dissolved in 250. So if we know the number of moles in 24.45, again, this is a ratio. So the moles is 1.4 times 10 to the minus 3. In 24.45 so in 250 we need to simply do the ratio so it's 250 divided by 24.45 it's roughly going to be 10 times as big roughly 10 times as big but here they've made it slightly more complicated that's not 25 24.3 so it's 250 divided by 24.45 so it's roughly 10 times as big so it's 1.4 times 10 to the minus 3 which comes out at 0.0132 moles. Now to find the MR, we need to say that the MR is the mass divided by, not MR, Wendy, the number of moles. Can't get the teachers these days. So that's divided by the number of moles. So mass divided by the number of moles will give us the MR. So there's the mass that we originally dissolved here, there's the number of moles, nice three sig figs, 98.2. The next question, you must learn these formula. You will not be given a formula sheet. Percentage uncertainty is the uncertainty of your apparatus divided by your measurement times by 100. And therefore, the measurement, you need to go back over. How big was the pipette? It was a 25 centimetres cubed. It had an uncertainty of 0.06. So your answer comes out to 0.24, a very easy mark there, if you can remember this equation. Again, here is procedural error. Why do you always have to fill the jet? Why do you check that the jet of your burette is full? So here I've drawn a nice air bubble, and you can see that that empty space there, once you start to run the acid out of the burette, will be filled with solution. And therefore you're going to get an increase, you're going to get a larger reading because the volume, the bubble is taking up volume that would be occupied by the solution. So you're going to get an apparent larger volume, a larger titration volume. Again, this is another procedural error. How do you minimise procedural errors? Well, if you rinse the inside of the flask, 
Uh, it doesn't give an incorrect result because it's just adding water. You're not changing the number of moles of sodium hydroxide that are going into the flask or the acid that's already in the flask. Simply rinsing it off the side. It's not changing the number of moles. Name the substances it's not changing the number of moles of. In this question, we're asking you to write an equation from words. And you're told that um, magnesium reacts with titanium chloride and it's TiCl4 so you should know there's going to be four chlorines because titanium's in group four and you should know from September that the formula of magnesium chloride is MgCl2 because magnesium can only form uh, form charge of plus two so two chloride ions and therefore to balance for chlorine you need to times it by two and there's your titanium. Why is magnesium a reducing agent? Because you can see here it's lost electrons it's gone from mg it's gone to mg2 plus ions oxidation is loss and therefore it's the reducing agent because it itself has been oxidized this next question here again they've given us the question in milligrams divide by a thousand and i've written it over the answer here 3.200 grams of magnesium oxide and magnesium hydroxide so we're acting it with carbon dioxide, magnesium carbonate and water, and we're getting water. Again, convert that into grams. So that's not point, I'll do that in red. So that's not 0 0.210 grams. Immediately, you can see looking at the ratio that one mole of magnesium hydroxide gives one mole of water. It's a one to one ratio. So you would have got a mark for as soon as you see anything that you convert to moles, be a chemist, convert it to moles. We can't convert this to moles because that's the sum of the two. So we can't convert that to moles, but we can certainly convert that to moles. So if you couldn't do anything, you would have got a mark by saying moles of water is mass over MR. Okay, so we now know that the mass of the sodium hydroxide that we've got is going to be the number of moles of it times its MR, and we've already got the number of moles because it's the same. So I've left that as a fraction there, times by the MR of magnesium hydroxide, and I've, you can, I've shown my working out for the MR of magnesium hydroxide at the side here, which is 58.3. So the number of moles is 0 0.0117 times by the MR, which is 58.3 which tells us the mass of magnesium hydroxide is 0 0.680. So therefore, the mass of the other compound, the magnesium carbonate, I've written magnesium here, that should say magnesium carbonate,
On this question, it was a straightforward empirical formula. What is the empirical formula of an oxide? And it's well worth, even though it's only worth one mark, uh, spending time on this question. So you can see if you've got four grams of molybdenum, then the oxygen is going to weigh one gram. You've got five grams in total. You go to your periodic table, the relative atomic mass of molybdenum is 96 and oxygen is 16. To get the number of moles, it's a uh, mass over a ma mass over relative atomic mass. When you divide by the smallest, you end up with a ratio of roughly one to one and a half. You can't round that up, you can't round that down. So if you times them both by two, then you end up with MO2O3. First question is delocalized electrons, electrons. You know this from GCSE that graphite conducts electricity. Moving on to the next one, which one is not pyramidal in shape? Well, he could have gone through them and spotted that boron is in group three and only has three valence electrons. So you could have gone there or you could have drawn them out using your VS, your valence shell electron pair repulsion theory. Phosphorus is in group five. It's got, therefore, three bond pairs and a lone pair. Um, all the rest were pyramidal. The next one here, what change occurs when water is vaporised? Well, if you're heating or you're breaking into molecular forces, you're going to be putting in energy. So therefore, that's going to be endothermic. You know when you boil any liquid, you do not break covalent bonds. Any, so you're not breaking the covalent bond between the hydrogen and the oxygen. That's an absolute no-no. Otherwise, you get hydrogen coming out of your kettle and exploding. So the most obvious answer is intermolecular forces. There's your hydrogen bonds. You're overcoming the hydrogen bonds between your molecules. The total energy of the molecule decreases. Well, if you're putting heat energy in, you're increasing. So that's rubbish as well. Next question here, which molecule does not have a permanent dipole? Well, there's electronegativity differences in all of them because bromine is more electronegative than carbon or hydrogen. It's a halogen. However, if we look at CBr4, it's a tetrahedron. It's perfectly symmetrical, so all the dipole moments cancel out. So the answer is D. Again, this is a GCSE question, which is why it's worth spending time on the calculations because you know you can get the exact answer again GCSE you know that diamond is not ionic so iodine is simple molecular nice easy question if we go to the next question radium look for it in your periodic table it's a metal and therefore what you know about metals is they're good conductor electric le electrons you know that it's going to form ionic compounds because it's metal metals always form ionic compounds so that's rubbish as well. And you know where radium is. If you look where radium is, it's in the bottom of group two. And you know group two react really vigorously with water, even from GCSE. Next question. Statement is not correct. Strontium has a lower first ionization energy than calcium. Well, that's true because strontium, if you look at your periodic table, is further down group two and its electrons are further away, so it's going to lose them. So that is correct. Strontium has a larger ionic radius is correct because, again, it's further down the group and it's got more shells. Strontium reacts less vigorously. Well, as you go down the group, the electrons are more easily lost, so it's going to react more vigorously. So there's your answer. Again, it's a GCSE type question. Again, if we look at group two, we're getting this increasing number of shells. So if you go down the group, which property increases with increasing atomic number? Well, atomic radius definitely is getting bigger. Electronegativity, you know, decreases because the electrons are getting further down the group. First ionization decreases because the electrons are getting further away. Melting point decreases because the metal atoms are getting bigger and the larger the metallic bond are weaker. So the answer is this one here, atomic radius. We left this one out because some of you haven't done redox, but the answer is fluorine for when we come to do group two. This question is to do with reacting volumes of gases, and we know that all gases at the same temperature and pressure occupy, so one mole of any gas occupies the same volume. Here we've got 20 centimetres cubed of butane, so that's, that would be two moles, would be making... Um, would make twice as many moles as carbon dioxide. 
So that would give 4 times 20, which would give 80 centimetres cubed of carbon dioxide. Just look at the mole ratio. 1 gives 4. 20 is going to give 4 times 20, which will produce 80 centimetres cubed. Notice that water is a vapour here, and you're going to get 5 times 20, because it's a 1 to 5 ratio, you would form 100 centimetres cubed. Therefore, the moles of oxygen that are going to react is 6.5 times 20, which is 130 centimetres cubed. So, let's now look at the which statement is correct. 40 cm cubed of carbon dioxide is formed. No, that's rubbish. 80 are formed. 0 0.065 dm cubed of oxygen reacts. No, we know 130 centimetres cubed of oxygen react, which is 0 0.130 dm cubed. Do 70 cm cubed of oxygen remain? Well, you've got a total of 0.2 dm cubed of oxygen, and you know that that uh, 0 0.130 is actually reacting, and therefore take one from the other, it's 70 centimetres cubed of oxygen. Question 22 we've decided to take away because we haven't studied group 7 yet, but the answer was C, because conch sulfuric acid is an oxidising agent, but we've not studied that yet. Right, if we now go to question 23, it's a simple percentage yield question, and you've got two masses. So you use the ratios here. So the mass of aluminium is uh, of aluminium is 20 that's produced. And we start with 50 grams of aluminium oxide. The MR of aluminium oxide is 102. The relative atomic mass of aluminium is 27. Do not use these ratios. MR is the mass of one mole of aluminium oxide or the mass of uh, AR, the mass of one mole of aluminium. Convert to moles, mass over MR. And look at the ratio. 2 to 4. So we should be getting twice as many moles of aluminium so we should be getting we times that by two we should be getting 0 0.980 moles of aluminium this is what we've actually got so the number of moles is the actual number of moles which is here divided by the calculated number of moles which is here and therefore that comes out to 7.5.6 and we can find our answer here 76 percent